Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so <laughs> glad that you have joined us. We have made a 10 year trip through the Bible and now we've gone through and made a very short trip through the Bible in about 18 months, something like that. Oh, yeah. And we are down to the last book of that trip through the Bible. So let's start. We've uh, had just a little introduction to it, but let's go to Revelation 1. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 1, and let's read the first three verses. Like this. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand." It's a great introduction. Mm -hmm. And it really gives us the reason for this whole book, is to show us things which are going to take, take, take place in the future, mm -hmm. or have taken place, or are going to take yeah. in the future. Last week in our discussion, we talked about some of the background, the situation and writing and who we thought wrote it and so forth. We'd like to start this week by looking at solid evidence for those things because, because the Adventist Church, for example, has taken this book as being such a central part to our understanding of many things, including the Great Controversy. We'd like to nail this down really tight, why we believe that the book of Revelation is a valid part of Scripture. And let's look at some of those things. In general, books of the Bible are, are validated. They're, people decided to include them in Scripture based on two things, two big categories. The first thing is internal evidence. What do we mean by the internal evidence? Does John, well, assuming John wrote the book of Revelation for right now, does he say anything about his name or anything about his personal experience in the book of Revelation? He yes, sure does. He does. <laughs> the first three verses. <laughs> exactly. In verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 4 of chapter 1. And just look at those real quick. Look at verse 4 that we didn't get to. From John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace be yours from God who is, who, is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits in front of the, his throne. Um, very clearly it's claiming there that um, it was John who wrote it. And look at verse 9, a few verses down. I am John, your brother, as a follower of Jesus. I am your partner in patiently enduring the suffering that comes to those who belong to his kingdom. I was put on the Isle of Patmos because I had proclaimed God's word and the truth that Jesus revealed. So again, and then if we go over to the end of the book, somewhere, well, chapter 21, verse 2, and I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, and if in, the, in the more traditional translations, it includes his name. I, John, saw the holy city. Um, right there. And then if we look at, John, uh, at Revelation 22, verse 8, I, John, have heard and seen all these things. And when I finished hearing and seeing them, I fell down at the feet of the angel who had shown me these things, uh, hmm. and I was about to worship him, and so forth. So here's the first bit of evidence. Uh, you, at least he claims to have been yep. the author of, of... Now, we don't know absolutely for sure that this was the same John that we read about in, in earlier in the New Testament, 
Do we have any evidence that he was that? Well, we have evidence that it was the disciple that was on the island of Patmos, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be the same John, don't you think? What does it say in verse 2? Let's pick a different translation that we haven't read. Who has a, an RSV or some of the, one of the more traditional ones? What do you have, Jim? This, Revelation 1, verse 2. It says, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Okay. All that he did what? So. That he saw. Oh. Regarding Jesus Christ, what is he claiming there? That he was the one that... Uh, he was a personal witness to the events of the life of Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So, in, uh, for, if we're going to accept the internal evidence, that means this person who claims to be the writer, whose name he claims was John, he says, I was a personal witness to the events of the life of Jesus. Now that's uh, pretty compelling internal evidence, isn't it? Okay. He, he's kind of, it's almost third person here, though, isn't it? He, he's speaking. It, it, it was a custom of those days to write in the third person. Yeah. 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 Unto his servant John, instead of unto me, yeah. who bear record of all the things that he saw, mm -hmm. that John person. It's written in, yeah. in third person. Yeah. Well, but John could have done that because this letter was going to go to churches, and the mm -hmm. churches had to know who wrote it. Like, mm -hmm. I would say, I, you know, I, Joanne, or something like that, to let the people know that it was me writing it. Yeah, sure. Well, going on, what other evidence do we have? There's plenty of evidence in this book that the author was a Jew. Not only does he make many references to the ideas from the Old Testament, and we've, all of us have experienced that already, and we'll see that many times, you really can't understand the book of Revelation unless you have some background from from the Old Testament. So many ideas are picked up from the Old Testament. You have to understand the whole sanctuary yeah. and the Jewish system. But not only that, he uses Hebrew words and phrases repeatedly throughout this book of Revelation. As part of, most, uh, as part of almost every prophecy, he uses imagery directly from scenes which were taken from the Jewish temple. Then, in Revelation 1.9, he states clearly that he was in prison on the Isle of Patmos because of his Christian teachings. So we would want to say, okay, who was it that we know of from early Christian history that was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos? Do we know anybody like that? And what other evidence do we have to suggest that? The historical facts regarding the apostle or disciple John is supported from extra-biblical sources. Um, and it's, I'll just mention it one case. Ecclesiastical history, this is an ancient book written basically by very, very early supporters of Christianity. Uh, chapter 3, verse 17.1 uh, down to 3.18.1 and many other references uh, suggest that, that these, these, these facts are historically accurate. Then we look at the fact that based on his messages to the Asia Minor churches in Revelation 2 and 3, it is clear that he stood in a position of authority over these churches. So, do we know anybody who was in a position of authority early in the history of the Christian church over the Asia Minor churches? We want to find out if there is such a person. Well, a disciple of Jesus certainly would qualify. Yeah. And once again, this fact regarding John is verified from extra-biblical sources. Again, ecclesiastical history, 3.23.1, if you care to look it up. Since Paul was the one who established the number of these churches, it seems very, very unlikely that this could be a reference to a time when Paul was still alive. So that narrows the time period down. Again, something else. There were many similarities between the wording of Revelation and the other writings of John. The phrase, Lamb of God, is used twice in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, while the term Lamb is used 26 times in Revelation to refer to Jesus Christ. There are only two other references to the use of the word Lamb in all of the New Testament. So, so oh, sorry. Go ahead. So those who think you, uh, this was written in 68, 69 A.D. are wrong? Well, uh, probably, yes, because 
Paul only died in 67 AD, or probably 68. So the idea that somebody else could have risen to prominence in the Asia Minor churches and sort of be in charge that quickly after that was, it seems very unlikely. Especially with new. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, the phrase, God is light, is used exclusively in John's writings. It's in the Gospel, it's in Revelation. Only John uses that, that idea. The idea that Jesus was the Word of God is found only in John's Gospels, his epistles, and the book of Revelation. Look at some examples. John 1, 4, you're presumably all, for, well, really 1 to 1 to 3. The Word was the source of life, and this, was life, and this life was brought, has brought life to humanity. And, of course, the word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and so forth. Uh, and look at, um, for example, 1 John 5, verse 7. There are three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three give the same testimony. We believe the testimony, and so forth. Um, and in, in Revelation 19, 13, the robe he wore was covered with blood. His name was the Word of God. So you're saying that John had certain ways that he, um, his conclusions about Jesus, and he carried these themes throughout the books that are attributed to him. And mm -hmm. you can tell because his, his thoughts, his themes about Jesus are included in every single one of those books. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. This and is additional evidence that it, it was almost certainly John who wrote this book. Okay. And then Paul had different ways of talking yes. about Jesus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that um, why you think the book of Revelation survived? Because it had all this evidence that there was an actual well, disciple that wrote this thing? And it, so... I mean, that, that's part of the evidence. We're just looking at different pieces of evidence. That's one of the pieces of evidence that it looked like it was John, the disciple John, who wrote this Book. But my question was, you know, you were talking about people were had a tendency to throw out Revelation because it some did. It's kind of weird, mm -hmm. and uh, so if if it was written by a disciple, yes, that would be a very that would be a one. good good reason to leave it in there. Yes, that was one of the two major criteria, was it not? Well. If it was, if it was inter, written by a we're written reviewing, by disciple. Yeah, we're, written, we're reviewing all the internal evidence now. And this is part of the internal evidence that you can read in the book itself. But we're doing that to verify that John wrote the book. Yes. And if John wrote the book, we want it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's if it. Jesus chose John, we'll choose John's writing. Yeah. 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 And furthermore, John is the only one who mentions the piercing of Jesus' side. John 19, 34 to 30. Let's just look at that. John 19, 34 to 37. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear in Jesus' side, and at once blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it so that you also may, may believe. What he said is true, and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there is another scripture that says, people will look at him whom they pierced. Okay, that's, that's more of that third party writing. Yes. <laughs> more, and be, all of John's writing is like now, that. Now, who was the one that Jesus told to take care of Mary? John. Okay, so John would have been at the foot of the cross. He was. And, and he, he definitely saw that. He was the only disciple who was there. Okay. Now, that remember, all of the immediate disciples, yeah. because John, uh, uh, um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea came later after Jesus was dead. Nicodemus came later after Jesus was dead. And we, we sometimes refer to them as... Peter as, split the other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now we mentioned there that in the Gospel of John, he s mentions the piercing. And then look at Revelation 1, verse 7. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced, pierced him. him. All people on earth will mourn over him, and so shall it be so forth. So again, another evidence that this looks like it comes from the writings of John. And another piece of evidence that is very interesting that I hadn't sort of put together until I started researching this, emphasis on the use of the number seven. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's going to say, oh yeah, we know there's lots of sevens in the book of Revelation, right? What about the gospel? The Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation are unique in the New Testament in their arrangement and use of the number seven. We find in the Gospel of John, 
listen to these. I hope you can recite all these after I tell them to you. That there are seven feasts, seven miracles, seven discourses, seven prophecies fulfilled, the seven I am declarations all woven in the framework of the gospel. Also woven in this gospel are seven testimonies of Jesus being rejected by Jews and accepted by the Gentiles and common people. Wow. So there's a whole bunch of sevens in the gospel of John as well. That's not really well known. No. The book of Revelation uses the word seven a total of 54 times. It refers to, now listen to this list, seven churches, seven angels, seven vials, seven plagues, seven kings, seven heads, seven crowns, seven mountains, seven thousand men, seven uh, thunders, seven trumpets, seven eyes, seven spirits, seven horns, seven seals, seven lamps, and seven stone uh, uh, stars. Is that enough sevens? Now, what is the meaning of seven? It Seven was, to a Jew meant complete, perfect, completion. Whole. Yeah, a whole, mm -hmm. no parts missing. Yes. a whole. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's a list of m most of the internal evidence to suggest that yes, we believe this was written by the 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 disciple John. Now, when John sat down and wrote these, do you think he thought, "I'm going to write seven of this and seven of that"? Or do you think it just so happened when he got done, there was seven of this and seven of that? I think, it, I think that's the way God revealed it to him. Hmm. You know. In Daniel 10, verse 16, this, the right hand that held the seven stars, is that related to the seven spirits, seven angels, seven yes. churches? Yeah. Okay. Now something that's much less known even than what we've been talking about so far. And this is the external evidence for believing that John was the writer. There are five different sources of evidence as to the authorship of the book of Revelation suggesting John was the author. There is, now listen carefully, patristic support of John's authorship. What's patristic support? <laughs> what do we mean by that? Patristic is a word that means father, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Patristic. Um, in the Latin. Early church fathers, we're talking about. Yeah. So this is early church, the early church fathers. And the early church fathers, all their writings are collected in books that are well known collection. So we're going to look in those books and say, did they believe that John wrote this book? Then there's patristic support of its authenticity. Not only did they think John wrote the book, but they believe it was truly inspired. Okay, that's the second point. The third point, early church canons, because we're going to find out that in, in, in those, early by those early church fathers, they started saying, well, these are the books we think belong in the New Testament. So a canon is a book that uh, belongs, a canon is another word for book? No, a canon is another word for a measure, and these are books that measure up to the standard they have set for books to be included in the New Testament. Okay. It's, it's it also a measures a person, though. <laughs> it could. It could be. Could measure a person. Yeah, yeah, could be. Okay. So it, uh, early church lists included the book of, not all of them, but a lot of them included the book of Revelation. Fourth, number four, early church versions. So when they made translations of the book of Revelation, I mean of the New Testament, and they wanted to include all the important books, did they include the book of Revelation or didn't they? That would be evidence. Somebody thought it was important, okay, we put it in our, in our version, and it, translating it into different languages. And then five, early church councils. What did the, the official councils that sat down and, and talked about these things, did they think this was a book written by John and that was an authentic and it was worth trusting as, as a part of scripture? Are all the answers yes, 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 yes? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. And yes, okay. Okay. The patristic support, the early church fathers, begins with Justin Martyr, who lived from A.D. 100 to 165. Now, when did John... He would have been a contemporary of John. Almost. He was, a, he was a babe, probably, and John had not yet died. Yeah. That's how close he was. Apollonius, who also lived during the second century, Theophilus of Antioch, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to mention these guys by name and mention their time periods. I could, I could show you, you know, if you go to these, to, to the, the sources, you would find out that all these people supported these things we're talking about. 
um, Theophilus of Antioch later in the second century. The Muratorian, Muratorian canon, I told, mentioned the canons. That, was written, that list was made somewhere around the year 200. Irenaeus, um, or Irenaeus, uh, AD 130 to 200. Again, you see how close he came to the time of John. Eusebius, from <coughs> year 260 to 340. Clement of Alexandria, from AD 150 to 215. Tertullian, very, the father of the Latin church, AD 160 to 225. Hippolytus, A.D. 170 to 236. Origen, A.D. 160, 185 to 254. And Victorinus, about approximately A.D. 300. Now, these people that you're naming, they all lived in that area of the world. In, and in the they were considered the, uh, the parents of the uh, Christian church that carried on after the deposit. Right, exactly. Disciples. And they wrote significant things, and people regarded them as authorities in the church. And they said, we believe that John wrote this book and it should be a part of the scripture. So that was basically the idea. Talk and about peer review. Yeah, it's peer <laughs> review, exactly. Eusebius, by the way, is, is one of those who confirmed the fact that John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. So he not only says, yes, I believe John wrote this, but here's, he was exiled to the, to the Isle of Patmos. Athanasius, AD 296 to 370, talked about him being exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Gregory Nazianzen from A.D. 329 to 389. And Jerome. What do we know about Jerome from A.D. 342 to 420? He has something to do with the Bible, a lot to do with the Bible. Okay, in what way? And did he translate it into some language? Jerome was the one who translated the, it into Latin, the official Latin version called the Vulgate. And he got in trouble for that? No, he was commissioned oh, by he, the church to do that. Okay. They didn't, he didn't do it exactly the way some of them wanted it to be done, but he did an excellent job in very readable Latin. Okay. These founders of the church, were they um, Jewish uh, Christians? Were they Gentiles? Oh, these people I'm quoting? You're just quoting? Most of, most of them were Gentiles. And what nationalities were they? Were they... Well, a variety. Just a variety? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And finally, Sophronius, AD 560 to 630, that would be some time later, but they all, all these people said, yes, we believe that John was on the Isle of Patmos. They sure had different names back then than yes. we do here. Mm -hmm. So what about the patristic support of its authenticity? The book of Revelation is quoted quite extensively in the early Christian book entitled The Shepherd of Hermes, written about AD 142. So if you see parallels between these two books and this one over here is using even though we don't consider the Shepherd of Hermes to be inspired that author whoever he was uh, wanted to quote from a, what he thought was an inspired source and he quotes many things from the book of Revelation what does that tell us it the book was, of Revelation was there to be quoted from yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and he thought it was authentic he thought yeah. it was authoritative the early church canons, the one, the most famous one, of course, is the Muratorian canon that was, written, that was con, you know, put together around the year 200 A.D. How many books were in that canon? All the ones that we think. He we actually have. included one or two extras that we don't include. I see. Yeah. Early church versions, can you guess which ones? Think of some that you know about. One we just mentioned, the Vulgate by Jerome. The Syriac translation, of course, what language of, is it in? Syriac? Kind of like Aramaic. It's, it's Aramaic. Syri it's Syriac is Aramaic. Aramaic. Yeah. These were all versions of the Bible in different early languages. Early translations of the Bible in a different language, including Arabic. There was a very early translation of the Bible into Arabic. And what are we saying about those versions? They, they, all, in, they included Revelation. They included the book of Revelation. So now how do we feel about the fact that someone coming along a thousand years later like Martin Luther said, well, I'm, I don't like what this book teaches. Let's throw it out. Well, he didn't live at the time, so he really um, shouldn't have done that. It's an example of how you can be blinded by your paradigm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we have to be very aware of that. Now, we want to give all due respect to Martin Luther. He, he certainly did marvelous things for the Christian church. However... Here's a place where apparently he made a mistake. 
Fortunately, he included the book of Revelation in his New Testament. I mean, it's, it's at the back. It's sort of in a secondary position, but at least it's there. But these people had included it, so he didn't throw it out completely. Yeah. He just says, I don't know what to do with it, so I'm going to put it back there. Yeah. And also, God uses people who make great mistakes to move yeah. his truth forward. Yeah. I think that's amazing that God doesn't require us to be perfect in order to yeah. be used by Him. In fact, if God required us to be perfect, how many of us could He use? I don't know. <laughs> uh, how, uh, what is the timing of these translations compared to some of the, that have been called the earliest Greek? Are some of these even, uh, translations even older than the earliest Greek that we have? No. No, no. Um, remember that the entire New Testament was written in Greek. We, of course, don't have any of those early original copies. Co the earliest copies we have, well, what we have are from the first, probably, say, second century, we have some little pieces of manuscripts and so forth, small chunks from the second century. We have... That's Greek you're talking that's about. That's Greek. We have considerably more in the third century, and by the fourth century, we have almost complete New Testaments in Greek. So these people that wanted it in, not in Greek, but in these other languages, might they have written theirs before the piece of Greek that we currently have? In some cases, yes. Yeah. To, 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 if you want to include the, old, the entire New Testament, you know, we have, a, we have a little piece of the Gospel of John that, that we have dated to approximately 125 A.D. Mm, That's old. Very good. That's very close. I mean, there's nothing else in the Bible anywhere that comes even close to it. I mean, what? That's within 25 years, more or less, of the time when it was written. Yeah. So we have, we have a little piece. It's written on both sides. It was a page, part of a page. So part of John, I think it's 17, and part of John 18 on both sides of this little, this piece of paper. So that would be really, really early, really close to its original source. Yeah. Is that the John Rylands? What? Is yeah. That's the John Rylands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So early church councils. Now we're getting now to the end of the 300s and 400s because when did the Christian church become proclaimed as the official religion of the Roman Empire? Was it in the 300s? 323, more or less, in the days of Constantine, right? Constantine and Eusebius. Mm -hmm. He declared that the, the Roman Empire was to be a Christian empire. The 27 books we now have as a part of the New Testament included the book of Revelation in the councils that, were, that happened in, in those days. There were also early church witnesses to the date and place of the writing of the book of Revelation. Eusebius. 8260 to 340 says the book of Revelation was written near the end of the reign of Domitian. Oh. Does, that, does that fit with everything else we know? Sure. Yeah, fits perfectly. Uh, Sophronius, 8560 to 688. The patriarch of Jerusalem also agrees. He wrote a whole book on the life of the evangelist John. And he said, yes, that's when it was written. So um, there is general support for the idea that the book was written while John was still a prisoner in the Isle of Patmos. For more details, see the origins and, and so forth. You can look at commentaries. Uh, there are people who put a lot of this inform information all together. And we're going to launch into our actual understanding of the book of Revelation when we come back, so don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. I hope you weren't uh, turned off in any way by all that historical detail about the, bo the, the book of Revelation and its author and why we believe it's absolutely authentic as a part of Scripture. Now let's turn to something more contemporary and language which may be seem more uh, relevant to you. Here's a little introduction to the book of Revelation as written by um, Eugene Peterson, the, uh, the, the translator or paraphraser, we might call him, of the Message Bible. He says this, The Bible ends with a flourish. Vision and song and doom and deliverance and terror and triumph, the rush of color and sound, image and energy, leaves us reeling. But if we persist through the initial confusion and read on, we begin to pick up the rhythms, realize the connections, and find ourselves enlisted as participants in a multidimensional act of Christian worship. John of Patmos, a pastor of the late first century, his worship on his mind is preeminently concerned with worship. The vision, which is the revelation, comes to him while he is at the worship, he is at worship on a certain Lord's Day on the Mediterranean island of Patmos. He is responsible for a circuit of churches on the mainland whose primary task is worship. Worship shapes the human community in response to the living God. If worship is neglected or perverted, our communities fall into chaos or under tyranny. Our times are not propitious for worship. The times never are. The world is hostile to worship. The devil hates worship. As the revelation makes clear, worship must be carried out under conditions decidedly uncongenial to it. Some Christians even get killed because they worship. John's revelation is not easy reading. Besides being a pastor, John is a poet, fond of metaphor and symbol, image and allusion, passionate in his, un, in, in his desire to bring us into the presence of Jesus, believing and adoring. But the demands he makes on our intelligence and imagination are well rewarded. For in keeping company with John, our worship of God will almost certainly deepen in urgency and joy. Nice. So, having said all that and had the introduction, now what are we going to do with the book? Do you think it's a, an apocalypse, a revelatory book that really teaches us something important? Or is it more like apocryphal, a hidden book that's full of mystery that we can't possibly understand? The former. The former. We get some insights in there that we, yeah. we don't get anywhere else, and yet it's consistent. It's not, it's not in conflict with the, with the rest of the book, mm -hmm. rest of the Bible. Well, like Jesus said, he spoke, Jesus spoke in parables so that he wouldn't get in trouble mm -hmm. with the powers that be. John spoke this way in the book so that the book would be able to survive and he wouldn't it wouldn't be destroyed by the powers that be. So we have to keep that understanding when we read mm -hmm. Revelation. He was writing it right under the noses of the jailers. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really agree with that too much. I think that some of the subject matter in here could not be told any other way. So I don't think it's just been, you know, as a um, a spy novel where you've got all this secret stuff going around, uh, there's just some things in the spiritual realities that are just you've got to go this direction in mm -hmm. order to to understand them. Well, John certainly Even did. that, as a truism, does not preclude what she said. Well, I think it just worked out that way, kind of in positive sense. I don't know if it if it was really the real reason for it. I can think of a lot easier ways to say almost all the, I no, think all this stuff. No, <laughs> the I think. was a pretty bad dude. I think, <laughs> I think, I think if this stuff, if this stuff was said that simple, you wouldn't really get your mind around it like you we're do when you to, have to read it this way. We're try to translate it and make it that simple. I also believe that Jesus spoke in parable also to teach you a Statistically, you were just you. I can say I can speak right now. The, you were just thick form of teaching because Artistic? it lets you. No, you were just yeah. H U H U -E U Heuristic. Heuristic. Thank you, because that allows you to absorb, to think, 
and to come up with the you know with things by yourself gives you a little time you know because when somebody just tell you something you can react really quickly without fully understanding you can get angry or whatever but when you come to things by yourself especially through the help of the holy spirit becomes it, part of you mm -hmm. becomes part of you which which if it was done simply it would just be a medallion you take out of your pocket and see mm -hmm. see isn't that cool but if it's something like this, your mind gets engaged, it actually becomes part of you. And I think that's a real important part. Well, so this. now let's, in light of all that, do anybody, does anybody at the table here feel like they fully understand every detail in the book of Revelation? No. <laughs> I am glad I don't, no. because wouldn't it be boring if all of a sudden you understood okay. everything? So let's realize that we've got a challenge in front of us as we look at the book of Revelation, okay? We've already suggested that many, many, many of the symbols and ideas in the book of Revelation come from where? The Old Testament. From the Old Testament. So if you don't have any idea, if you haven't read the Old Testament and have at least some modicum of understanding of the Old Testament, you're going to have a big problem with looking at the book of Revelation. What's interesting is um, I received uh, a present from a relative and it was just the New Testament. The Old Testament was not, I mean, there are books that just have the New Testament and they had Revelation in it. Oh, really? Which is interesting because you can't go back yeah. and see what Revelation is saying. And it's particularly important that we do something that Christians generally have not done, and that's that there are certain words used many times in the book of Revelation that have to be understood in, from, from the biblical context and not from reading Webster's Dictionary. Words like wrath and anger, fire, forever and ever, Babylon, beasts, harlots, these things have to be understood in light of their usage and meaning elsewhere in Scripture. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get, you're not going to figure Revelation out. You're just not going to manage to understand the book of Revelation. There's some keys that you have to have yeah. or else it won't unlock. So yeah. fire isn't necessarily a campfire. No. But a, a classic example for, of that is the word Babylon. What is, Paul, what is John talking about when he uses the word Babylon? Babylon is the name of a city that existed in the Old Testament. Okay. Is that all it is? No. Referring to Rome. It, it, Pretty clearly, it, it was clearly a code word in New Testament times for Rome. So you need to understand when it talks about Babylon has fallen. Now, it also, we're going to find out, refers not just to literal Rome, it's going to refer to spiritual Rome and all that it stands That's for. Spiritual Babylon, actually, yeah. because and Rome already fell. So, yeah, it's okay, fell. it's fell. You know, so something else is we got, coming we've up. We've got something that took it up mm -hmm. that isn't falling. Well, also, it was Roman soldiers that were over um, John, right? Yes. And so, the Isle of Patmos. And so his code word of Babylon kept those soldiers from thinking it was Rome, unless... Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you could see that, <laughs> because I don't know if that's exactly what happened, because a lot of times they're captors actually got converted. Well, let's hope there were some, but we have no evidence <laughs> so of that. So it could happen either yeah. way. I still don't understand the connection, well, fully, the connection between Babylon, the whore, the ant Antichrist, and the beast, the way it's presented in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little complicated. Yes. Okay, well, we're going to work on that. We're not going to take lots and lots and lots of time working through it, but, but these are things we need to um, to, to, to face. So we have suggested, and based on all these internal and external sources, that it was written by John on the Isle of Patmos near the end of the reign of Domitian. You know, Domitian was, was murdered, assassinated, and someone took his place, and then he, John and others were released from the Isle of, of Patmos. Um, Adventists, as we suggested earlier, on the other hand, accept much of the, what Luther taught. We also believe in the sanctuary message, which is all just set out in the book of Hebrews, and the great controversy, which is the core of the book of Revelation. We have no reason to reject James or Jude either, or Second Peter. 
So while Luther usually used primarily only 62 books of the Bible, we prefer to use all 66. And then this interesting comment, I'd like to hear, see what you think. The, the main founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, said these words about the book of Revelation and Daniel, his companion book. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. That's found in the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 114. What was she talking about? When you understand something, you are different than when you don't understand something. Okay, but this well, I think I think going beyond just the simple understanding. There's a lot of prophecy in Revelation, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and Daniel isn't that isn't that in Daniel too? So isn't that kind of a a different kind of talking than usual than a lot of the scriptures, which talks about. Um, you know, uh, stories, mm -hmm. uh, history, and that kind of thing. Uh, revelation, when you talk prophecy, you're actually talking in a different type of thought, which would give you a what? different different outlook of okay. the whole thing. What, that, now, that would be my question then. Okay, so now we believe that, that maybe written in code form or whatever, we have these prophecies, some of them fairly lengthy time prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, how does that affect our religious experience? Religious well, experience as a po as contra in contrast to religious content, ideas, uh, knowledge. And what I hear her saying here is if we had a better knowledge, a better understanding of the book, it would result in a different experience, a different emotional content, a different maybe focus on what we're involved with. Well, okay. in Revelation, when you understand what's going on, you realize that God is real and God can foretell the future. Mm -hmm. it's, it's evidence in your mind, so it puts a foundation under your faith that God is well, it's, it's like when Jesus told about himself as they were going along to the cross. And, um, and then when he died and rose again, these things that they told, that Jesus told his disciples, they finally understood it. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, I mean... They had an entirely different religious That's experience. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So this okay. can actually do the same thing. Okay, do, do there's you, a reason. There's a very specific reason why I think she said that. And let's we'll see if we can figure out what it is. Is there, is there anything really unique about Daniel and Revelation that are not in any other books of the Bible? They have Prophecy. predictions. Prophecies, but there's something more than just the prophecies. Because there are prophecies in other books of the Bible. Ezekiel had prophecies, Jeremiah had prophecies, uh, Zechariah has some long-term prophecies. They uh, match. They speak of the same thing. Yes. Where do we read about the first hints of some sin? Sin. That's in Genesis. Earliest, the earliest history of sin. Oh. Okay. In, in the war. <laughs> <laughs> the war up in heaven. Oh. Yeah. The whole point of Daniel and Revelation is understanding the great controversy. Sin didn't start on earth. No. Sin started in heaven. So then if we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, we're looking, because in, even in the book of Daniel, angels came down and they said, look, Daniel, there's a huge something going on here. You know, and Daniel literally saw the angels and he recognized, hey, something's going on here. And then we go over to the book of Revelation and here we see, man, there was a, there was a controversy starting way back in heaven. Jesus fought against Michael, his name there, when he's fighting against the devil, fought against Satan and his angels. And so clearly it looks to me like the thing that's really different about understanding the book of, books of Daniel and Revelation and therefore causes us to take a, a different view of the whole rest of Scripture is this basic idea of the great controversy. So it it gives context of everything else in the Bible, yeah. which 
it isn't like in a vacuum anymore. That no. this is this is putting it out all over the place where it's where the Bible is based. Yeah, exactly. So, when she wrote this, where was that in contact in the context of when she got the Great Controversy Vision? This was written. You know, if you look at the, the, the writings of Ellen White, she first got a Great Controversy vision in 1857. And then she, re, she wrote that in some small books. Mm -hmm. Later, about 20 years later, she, she, not quite 20, 15 years later, she expanded on that. And then starting about 10 years after that, well, a little less than that, 8 to 10 years after that, she started writing them out in the large version, those five volume books, five large volumes we call the Conflict of the Ages series. So she was well into pushing that, uh, that concept when yes. she wrote these words. Exactly. And, and, and the time when she really, really, really sort of jumped on this great controversy theme and it just sort of transformed everything she said after that was around the year 1888 to 1890. Well, you know, Sunday laws were coming in yeah. at about that time. In, uh, so yeah. that's what it, and she wrote, she wrote Great Controversy, 1888. She wrote Patriarchs and Prophets, 1890, and so forth. Is she starting, is she starting to present the whole history, the, the whole history of the Bible, basically? She says, I, I need to write that in this context. And that's an entirely different religious experience. Well, the book of Revelation, when you read about war broke out in heaven, all of a sudden you're saying, wow, we are not the center of the universe. Yeah. It is not just about us. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a perspective of how many more beings are involved in this besides just us, yep. Earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's shocking. It's not just about us. Yeah. Much expanded paradigm. Expanded that paradigm, that's, yeah. But, but, but if it wasn't about us, if we weren't involved, who would care about all that other? It's because we are involved that that becomes meaningful. And everything which has happened here. That's right. God has chosen to focus his, his dealing with the great controversy on this planet and involving us as a human race. That's right. So this becomes a huge, big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, though, that we look at the rest of the Bible and we see those are stories. You know, there's David and there's Daniel and there's Joseph and there's Abraham and there's you know all those people and you might think well, these are just a lot of interesting stories but if you if you look at those stories and say hold on let's back off a little bit what is God trying to say to us through all these stories all of a sudden you see a different picture if you're looking very carefully and I like to to put it like this, you may not agree with this, but I, I find this helpful. It's like writing a final examination on a major course in college. The difference in this case is God says, let me give you the answers and you figure out what the questions are. God is asking us to say, okay, when Abraham did this, what was going on behind the scenes? What was the devil doing? What was God doing? down through the history. Every story we read, we need to say, okay, what was going on behind that story? What was going on behind that story? What was going on behind that story? And so it's like you're saying that this concept of the great controversy throughout history is like a set of glasses with a filter in it. Yes. And once you have a filter identified, go back to the very beginning of Scripture yes. and read everything in the context of that new filter. Yes. And that it's all being done on a great big stage, yes. a theater. And that's First exactly what Paul nine. says. Yeah. So, First Corinthians 4, 9, isn't it? We're a, we're a, we're a theater. And, and God, the is universe. On, God is on trial before the universe. Yeah. That's, he's, he's, his character, the way he runs his universe, He's answering the questions, and he has to do it long, methodical, long periods of time. He can't just exhort, or excuse me, resort to lies and deception and extortion and As threats the devil and intimidation. Does. Like, yeah. Is that what God <clears throat> means when He says, "Let us reason together"? Yes. Yep. He's expecting us to use our reason to put the pieces together. So now, considering this is the last book in the Bible, what have we just said? Think of the enormous implications of this. God says, you've read through the storybook. 
you've seen what happened from starting from Genesis, you've gone through, you've gone through, you've gone through. From, now that you've got all the way to the end, I'm going to give you a book that hopefully, if you've all understood all these things and you've got some keys to understanding this last book, all of a sudden you're going to say, whoa, God says, go back and read it again. And you're going to read it with a new set of glasses. And you're going to see an entirely different picture to all of Scripture. Exactly as Ellen White said. Entirely different religious experience. You're going to see the Bible unfold in a way you never thought possible. And I might add, many stories in the Bible can be explained basis, based on this great controversy theme and what's going on behind the scenes that are very difficult to explain. Why in the world did that happen if the great controversy was not there? Why, why the book of Job? Yeah. Why, why put that man through all that? Uh -huh. yeah. So this book, when you start through it, casually is very confusing and you throw it away mm -hmm. and you go back to the Gospels mm -hmm. whereas if you stay with it mm -hmm. and find out this this particular principle of the great controversy now you can go back to the whole of Scripture and begin to put the and, and the pieces begin to fall together like a puzzle and all of a sudden the picture comes into view and it's a picture of God Absolutely. The picture, this, the Bible is not about Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and, you know, down Joseph and da 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 down through the Bible. It's not primarily about those people. Those people are the characters out on the stage, but the story is about God behind the scenes. And that's an entirely different way of looking at Scripture. But that must be why the majority of our Christian friends miss it. Yeah. Because it, that is given in the book of Revelation, which they don't spend much time in. And as I suggested a moment ago, God is saying to us, when you get to Revelation, if you've, got, if you've done your homework all through the Bible, and now you start seeing what's going on in the book of Revelation, all of a sudden you see this new set of glasses and you say, oh, it's time to read it again, and then it's time to read it again, and then it's time to read it again. And that's, a tire, that's an entirely different religious experience. Do you think John had that religious experience when he I was did. writing? All of a sudden, oh, this makes sense, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, in mm -hmm. places he just almost says, wow. Mm -hmm. you know? uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So we have seen then that it's very important that we look at the book of Revelation, that we pull in the, the pictures from the Old Testament primarily, but so, even some from other parts of the New Testament, so that we understand the book of Revelation, and then we see partway through, in fact, right in the middle of the book of Revelation, we pick up our new set of glasses, and we say, okay, now we're going to take a new look at the whole Bible, all the way from beginning to end, in the context of this new way of, of looking at things. Which is interesting in light of the fact that how was this done back in the beginning? When John wrote the book, what do you think was the first thing that happened to it? It was read. Someone, read someone probably sat down and read a scroll. I don't know how John managed to afford a scroll that long enough to write, write the book of, of, of Revelation on. It would have been very expensive in those days. Maybe he had it with him. He was already thinking about doing something writing something when he went to the island. Who knows? The, the, the guys that were taking care of hoped that they would write and stay out of trouble, so they gave them all the materials to write with. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know. But, okay, our New Testament friends, did they get all that message when, when someone stood up and started unrolling the scroll and reading it out loud? Remember, Norm was read to us twice now, once last week and once this week, Blessed is he who does what? Reads out loud, and those who do what? Hear. Hear the message of the book of Revelation, because they don't have even written copies, and certainly don't have the fancy electronic copies. I, I'm looking around our table now, and, and, and smiling to myself, thinking, when we started 
this study, everybody had their Bibles and their papers, and they were going like this, and now almost everybody has you electronic. You can tell who's high tech and who isn't. <laughs> <laughs> See? Although Gary's very high tech here. Yeah. It so. says in here, this is the only biblical book that comes with a blessing for the one who listens to it being read and explained and then responds. And Ellen White said, you get an entirely different religious experience. Which is a blessing. Which is a blessing. Exactly. So how would the person who had this read to them at that time, how long would it take? It, it takes a couple hours to, to read this. They probably did it in separate sessions. In they session. probably didn't read the whole thing through nonstop. So they took six weeks mm -hmm. and uh, they went through this and they listened to it. And they were confused all the way through until finally they got to the end and everything turned out great and they said, wonderful. Yeah. Well, I don't think they were confused all the way through. I think they had a different, I think they looked at this book in context, in their context in those days, and they saw things all along that, yeah. How about this, the churches, the, yeah. the teaching of the Particularly churches? Particularly those. They had some in insights. Uh, they knew people in those churches. Oh, they knew the Old Testament. Yeah. And they Completely. knew the Old Testament much better than most of us probably do. Mm -hmm. And so as they're reading through this, they see these clues, they, and they know the churches and so forth. And so they say, oh, yeah, da, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they won't read everything into it that we do now that we're at the other end of history. But uh, I think they received a tremendous blessing. And as Norm suggested, especially when they got to the end, they said, Hooray! <laughs> we're going to win. Jesus has won this already. We're on his. We're on the right side. Even though it certainly didn't seem like it, as they were hovering in their little rooms, hoping nobody would discover them, right. because they they would be killed if they were discovered. So, the Book of Revelation is going to prove a very interesting study. We'll spend the next few weeks looking at it. We're not going to take a huge long time. But we hope that you've enjoyed looking at the historical background, the evidence internal and external for the authenticity of the, of the book, who wrote it and why he wrote it. And now we're going to jump into the book as we move on. And we're going to see that there's a lot of things to learn from this book that John wrote so long ago under the inspiration of his personal best friend, Jesus Christ. Join us as we continue in the future.